We live in a world where the idea of privacy is constantly being redefined. Surveillance cameras, third-party software, and the ever-present cell phone pretty much guarantees that at any given time, somebody may be watching you. And while pictures and video footage can aid law enforcement and sometimes benefit our own personal safety, when surveillance is used to compromise our privacy, the results can be a shattering of our own sense of well-being. But there's nothing more terrifying than being observed or stalked by an individual who then uses that observation to compromise you in some way, just in an effort to let you know they can get to you at any time. This next story is about an effort to terrorize a family for reasons we may not ever truly understand. This is extremely strange. Derek Broadus grew up in a working class family in Maine and had gone on to work for an insurance company in Manhattan, eventually working his way up to senior vice president. His wife Maria had been brought up in the quiet suburbs of Westfield, New Jersey, and in 2014, when they discovered that a home there, just a couple of blocks from where she had grown up, had been put on the market by its owners, John and Andrea Woods, she and Derek believed it would be the perfect place to raise the couple's three children. With Derek's company's salary being enough to afford its $1.3 million price tag, the Broadus' bid was accepted, and with immense excitement, they began to move into their new six-bedroom home at 657 Boulevard, what they truly felt was their dream house. Three days after the closing, Derek, alone in the house, after finishing up some painting he was doing sometime around 10 p.m., went outside to check the mail. There wasn't much inside the box except a few bills and a small white envelope the type that usually contains an invitation or a thank you card of something of that nature. The envelope was addressed to the new owner. At first it appeared to contain a warm welcome to the neighborhood as it began and seemed to be written in the spirit of a fond greeting. But then the tone and tenor of the note took a really weird turn. Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, Allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father in the 1960s, it is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. I see already that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be. Tisk tisk tisk. Bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. You have children, I have seen them. So far, I think there are three that I have counted. Are there more on the way? Do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Once I know their names, I will call them and draw them to me. I asked the woods to bring me young blood, and it looks like they listened. Signed, The Watcher. This bizarre letter also described the family's Honda minivan, and while they were chatting with some neighbors in the yard, their kids were out there playing as well, which means that this psycho was absolutely watching them from the shadows. At this point, Derek felt his heart sink and panic set in. He rushed back inside the house and turned off all the lights so no one could see through the windows. He immediately contacted the Westfield police, who sent a patrolman to the house. The officer read the note, and when he finished, he asked Derek what it was all about, 
and if he had any enemies that might send such a threatening letter to his home. Before leaving, the officers searched the property and suggested Derek move some construction equipment from the porch, as it could be used to break a window to gain entrance. Derek then left the house and rushed back to join Maria and the kids, who were staying at a different location in town. When he showed Maria the letter in private, she too felt a sickening feeling wash over her, followed by a combination of confusion and dread. Because the woods were mentioned in the note, the Broadduses decided to send them an email that night, asking if they knew who the author might be or why they had referenced them in that weird request for new blood. The following morning, the Woods replied to them. To their alarm, Andrea admitted that they too had received an anonymous letter mere days before moving out that, like theirs, was signed The Watcher. Their letter also laid claim to an observance of the property over a period of time, but Andrea said they had never received anything like it in the 23 years they owned the house, and perhaps thinking it was meant to be nothing more than a juvenile prank, threw it away without giving it a second thought. Later that day, the Woods accompanied the Broadduses to the police station, where they met with Detective Leonard Lugo, who advised them not to share the contents of the letters they had received with anyone, as every one of their neighbors had to be considered a suspect. For the next few weeks, the Broadduses were in a state of high anxiety and apprehension. A work trip Derek was supposed to go on was canceled, and the children were not allowed to stray out of their sight. When a couple who lived on the block were given a tour of the home, Derek was momentarily stunned when the wife innocently remarked how it would be good to have some young blood in the neighborhood. Contractors who would arrive to perform work on the home noticed that their business signs had been removed from the front yard. Now the goal of a terrorist is to place people in a high state of alert and force them to change their behavioral patterns. This disruption of normality makes the subject fearful about what's going to happen to them next. In the Broadus' case, unfortunately, they were soon going to find out. Two weeks after the first letter arrived, Derek and Maria stopped by the house to look at paint samples and check the mail. To their horror, they again found a small white envelope and without hesitation summoned the police. This time the letter addressed them directly, albeit misspelling their name as Bradis. It read in part, Welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The workers have been busy and I have been watching you unload carfuls of your personal belongings. The dumpster is a nice touch. Have they found what is in the walls yet? In time they will. 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all of the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood play in the basement? Or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. I am pleased to know your names now in the name of the young blood you have brought to me. You certainly say their names often. Will they sleep in the attic, or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll note as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher, and I have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, my obsession. And now you are too, Bradis family. Welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard and now it has brought you to me. The house is crying from all of the pain it is going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. You are stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be the time when I roamed its halls. The 1960s were a good time for 657 Boulevard, 
when I ran from room to room imagining the life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then I got old and so did my father, but he kept watching until the day he died. And now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. Have a happy moving in day. You know I will be watching. Also in this letter, they talk about an artist's easel that they saw on the porch and whether the child that used it was the artist in the family. Okay, this is where I editorialize a little bit. Now I feel all you dads out there ready to call the boys and wait in the bushes with some pipes and some bats and wait for somebody to show up. And as for you mama bears out there, no pipes or bats necessary for you just your bare hands in order to rip someone's face off their head. Am I right? Now I'm not advocating violence. Well yeah, I'm advocating violence. At this point Derek and Maria stopped bringing the kids to the house and the goal of actually moving in was no longer a certainty. The sheer terrorism released on them was now taking a heavy toll. As the delay in moving extended, the letters continued. 657 Boulevard is turning on me. It is coming after me. I don't understand why. What spell did you cast on it? It used to be my friend and now it is my enemy. I am in charge of 657 Boulevard. It is not in charge of me. I will fend off its bad things and wait for it to become good again. It will not punish me. I will rise again. I will be patient and wait for this to pass and for you to bring the young blood back to me. 657 Boulevard needs young blood. It needs you. Come back. Let the young blood play again like I once did. Let the young blood sleep in 657 Boulevard. Stop changing it and let it alone. So what if anything did they learn about the letters? Let's start with the town and the surrounding neighborhood. Westfield is an upper income residential town with a population of around 30,000 and was named the 30th safest town in the country. Its most pressing issues are things like aggressive parking enforcement. Living on the boulevard is considered a sign of status and competition for properties there can be fierce with 657 considered perhaps the most desirable one on the street. The specific details contained in the letters would point to the writer as someone from the immediate neighborhood, or at least close by, who was expressing their envy about another family owning the home. Yet the Woods claimed there were only two other potential buyers, with one pulling out because of medical issues and the other finding a different house to purchase. The letters were being sent from close proximity. They were processed in Kearney, New Jersey, with the first postmark before the sale went public and only a day before interior renovations began. A for sale sign was never posted on the property. So with all of that, I think it's safe to assume that either by word of mouth or some other means, somebody knew that the Woods were going to put this house on the market. The artist's easel on the porch referenced in one of the letters is hidden by bushes from the street and can only be seen from right behind the house or from next door. Frustrated by what they perceive to be a lack of urgency by the police, who claim that, short of a confession, things were at a standstill, the Broadduses decided to launch their own investigation as they felt, rightfully so, their kids' well-being was at risk. Derek had gone so far as to tell police that he would not hesitate to take matters into his own hands. Surveillance cameras were installed, and Derek would spend many a night crouched in the bushes, waiting to see someone, anyone, observing the house at night. He created, for all intents and purposes, a case file of the events, detailing which neighbors might be able to hear the names of the children being spoken and how long each had owned their properties in an attempt to narrow the list of potential suspects down. A private investigator was hired to stake out the entire neighborhood and run background checks on people, but none of those efforts would turn up a legitimate lead. 
Derek went so far as to consult the FBI agent who was the basis for the character of Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs and hire another former agent, Robert Lenahan, to conduct a threat assessment. Profiling the writer based on the content of the letters, Lenahan felt they were an older person who had a certain way with words and likely was an avid reader. They would often mention the weather conditions that day, the lines were double-spaced, and despite the expressions of anger, no profanity was ever used, suggesting a certain lack of machismo. There also seemed to be a disdain for the affluent with lines like, are you one of those Hoboken transplants that's going to come in here and ruin Westfield? This would suggest the desire for the town to remain free of newbies coming in and waving cash around. Sort of like the age-old new money versus old money thing. Suspicion would often flirt with paranoia with Derek and Maria constantly scanning faces, looking for tells in any conversations that were either held or overheard. Others would come forward with their own suspicions, like the house painter, who noticed the couple behind them had their lawn chairs unusually close to the broadest property line. It was also discovered that two registered child sex offenders lived within a few blocks of them. Few were spared scrutiny as the search for the letter sender expanded.